Good morning, everybody, and uh, a very warm welcome to Supporting Ethnic Diversity in Entrepreneurship, which is brought to you by the Entrepreneurs Network, which is the Secretariat for the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Entrepreneurship, and an amazing think tank for Britain's most ambitious entrepreneurs, and also by Nat West. Uh, I'm Alison Cork. I'm your chair for today. I'm also an entrepreneur myself and an advisor to TEN. Um, we've only got an hour today and a really packed agenda, so I'm going to dive straight in. Uh, in a few moments, we're going to hear from our amazing panel uh, on this subject, and then there will be time for Q&As, hopefully a good half an hour. Um, but first of all, uh, I'd just like to introduce Andrew Harrison, who is the head of business banking at NatWest and responsible for the delivery of a full range of banking services to around a million small business customers. So, Andrew. Over to you. Thank you, Alison. Um, so NatWest is delighted to be supporting this event today um, as a leading supporter of um, small businesses across the UK. You know, we really do recognise that you know, making sure that we support all parts of the UK economy communities is, is really important. Uh, our purpose as a bank is to uh, champion potential and to help families, businesses and communities thrive. And in doing that, we really need to make sure that we're reaching out to all parts of the UK. And I see events such as today as a great opportunity you know, to really open up a debate and a discussion about how the banks and the financial services community in general can really help businesses and people meet, meet their full potential. So thank you, Alison. Minute, I just want to check that you can hear me. Can you hear me? Fantastic. OK, um, so it's now my great pleasure to introduce Kemi Badenoch MP, who is the Exchequer Secretary and Parliamentary Undersecretary of State in the Government Equalities Office. Kemi, over to you. Hello, Alison. Hi, Kemi, over to you. Thank can you. you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Um, and thank you. Thank you very much for having me this evening and good morning, everyone. Uh, I should probably just start by thanking Philip and the Entrepreneurs Network, as well as Alison and Andrew for inviting me to speak at today's event. And the topic is an important issue. It's one that's very close to my heart. Um, some of you will know that I'm a first generation immigrant and I moved here when I was 16 without any kind of family network in this country. I had to support myself uh, throughout. And so making sure that people are able to get on and succeed without obstacles is what I came into government to do. And so that's why uh, it's very important that uh, the all parliamentary, the all party parliamentary group on entrepreneurship and um, the entrepreneurs network should be looking to address this. I know how hard the group works to encourage, support and promote entrepreneurship. And today's meeting is very much in that spirit. And our discussion takes place, of course, during Black History Month which uh, is an opportunity to celebrate the contribution of Black Britons in making our country what it is today. And you can't have those success stories um, that about making the contributions without um, the sort of efforts that we're having, that we're making, we're discussing today. If we wanna have the success stories that history is gonna be talking about in the future, we need to make sure that we are creating an enabling environment for people to contribute and also to succeed. So today I'm wearing several different hats. I'm the Exchequer Secretary to the Treasury, and that has a very, very broad brief. Uh, it includes UK growth, productivity, it includes R&D, green infrastructure, and so much more. But I'm also the Minister for Equalities. So it's a very nice, um, it's a very nice uh, combination, a very interesting combination as well, getting to look at issues from different lenses. And I'm really proud to be uh, in this government. It's the most diverse government we've ever had. Um, it's not just me. I'm sure many of you have seen the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, the Business Secretary, Alok Sharma. This is a government that has very many people from ethnic minority backgrounds contributing right at the top, two of the four great offices of state. And those are just the, the cabinet ministers. There are many more of us um, just like myself, who are junior ministers all around government. And we believe our country is the most inclusive in the world. And that doesn't just happen by chance. Um, we have to work at it. And that's why we're committed to ensuring that everyone has equal opportunities to become an entrepreneur and a successful one at that. 
So why don't we start with the, the state of play? Uh, many of you would have seen the British Business Bank's uh, recent report on entrepreneurship and diversity. And this survey is really important. It's the first of its kind. And it shows that entrepreneurs from different backgrounds are having different obstacles and sometimes bigger ones uh, than others. And the BBB found that for ethnic minority entrepreneurs, they just face more challenges uh, in starting and growing a business than white counterparts. The median turnover was 25,000 compared to 35,000 for white business owners. Median productivity of their businesses is less than two thirds of, uh, of white entrepreneurs. Only half of black entrepreneurs met their financial aims, uh, sorry, their non-financial aims compared to nearly 70% of white entrepreneurs. And the report accounts for other factors such as household income, education, deprivation, age, disability. And it found that across all the factors, BME groups uh, fared worse, much worse in some cases than their counterparts. So why is this happening? What is going on? And um, what we're finding is that it's a complex picture. So access to finance, for example, is a huge issue and it plays an inherent role in the success rate of businesses started by BME entrepreneurs. And that's the reason why 39%, 49% uh, respectively, stop working on their business idea. I think that's white versus um, BME entrepreneurs. Where an entrepreneur lives and the lack of representation, perhaps in a senior workforce position, if they've come from a corporate background, can sometimes go some way to explaining this, these difficulties. But the evidence is telling us that we need to do more to fully understand how race, gender, geography, income, all of these things are shaping individual entrepreneurs' experiences. Um, so what is the government's position? We believe in fairness and equality of opportunity. And we understand the crucial value that entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship uh, bring to this country. We understand that you as entrepreneurs, in fact, so I say you, many of you on this call are key drivers of the UK economy and you're absolutely crucial to our commercial landscape. And we are utterly uncompromising in our belief in fairness and equality of opportunity. And I know that this is easier said than done, but we've actually been working hard to turn that belief into action. So even in the face of the pandemic, the government's business support packages have been able to support entrepreneurs from diverse backgrounds. So we always look at who exactly is getting the money and what we can do to make sure that it's being distributed more fairly um, or as fairly as possible. So, for example, 65 percent of future fund funding went to companies with ethnically diverse management boards. That was uh, over 400 million pounds. And the government is committed to ensuring that all of these interventions, just like that, uh, that future fund, are, are going to people of all backgrounds. So it isn't just about race, for example. It's, uh, you know, class, your geography. Um, and it's, it's a very, very interesting way of making sure that we are leveling up. You would have heard about our leveling up agenda. It isn't just about North and South. It's about all of these various factors. Um, on the issue of ethnicity, again, I know that the BBB Startup Loans Program delivered more than 75,000 loans uh, to entrepreneurs to date. That provided more than 600 million pounds of funding. 10% of those recipients were black, 3% were Asian, 5% were of mixed ethnicity. And there is still more that we want to do and hope to do. So the government is committed to leveling up, as I said, opportunities for all entrepreneurs. And this year we launched the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities, and we're looking deeper into disparities between different ethnic groups um, that's across the board to find measures to promote equality and diversity. And one of the Commission's working groups is focused on employment and entrepreneurship. Um, and this strand has been focused on building evidence on the barriers that minority groups face when starting and scaling their businesses and accessing finance. And the British Business Bank is providing the secretariat for this working group. They've convened a series of workshops with stakeholders to explore the evidence and discuss barriers to entrepreneurship. And we will keep a close eye on that work. Um, meanwhile, in our venture capital programs, the Enterprise Capital Funds Program and British Ca uh, Patient Capital, that's what those are, we're going to continue to seek out fund managers with diverse networks and assess their approaches to diversity both in investment strategy implementation as well as team composition. And this is going to be an integrated part of our due diligence process. What we don't want to see is people just giving money to people, to others who look like them or who seem like them. It has to be to, to those who are most deserving. 
The Treasury is also responsible for the Investing in Women Code, and that aims to increase transparency around investments and encourage finance providers to support female entrepreneurs. We've been working closely with signatories across venture capital, angel networks, and traditional retail banks as well to implement this code. We engage regularly with business and trade organizations, and we'll continue to work with them in the design of interventions. And that's that's the point, really. None of us can solve this on our own. We all agree there's a problem, but it's only by working together that we can solve that problem. And I'm very optimistic that we will solve it. Even the fact that, that uh, I'm at a meeting like this and we're having these discussions, it's just evidence of the will and the determination to focus um, and tackle the topic. So thank you very much for participating today. And thank you for everything you're doing to make opportunity available to all, just as it should be. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, Kemi. That was uh, that was incredibly interesting. I was taking notes like crazy there. Um, just before we uh, we go on, so I know that you are unable to stay for the Q and A's, but just thank you for your input and for as long as you're on the screen. Um, thanks very much indeed. Um, my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, actually, just whilst it's on my mind, um, with another one of my hats on, I'm an ambassador for the British Library Business and IP Centres. And anybody out there watching who is uh, maybe starting or just scaling an early business, do look into that because um, not only is this totally free resource um, and very valuable in terms of its market intel reports and IP advice, um, but it has a particular success rate with BAME and female-led businesses, and it's really something worth uh, looking into. So that's the British Library Business and IP Centre, which has regional centres around the country, and the plan is to uh, to roll these out uh, across the whole of England, um, but just something worth looking into. Um, I'd now like to introduce um, Wilfred Emmanuel Jones, who is a British farmer and founder of The Black Farmer, which is a range of British meat and organic food products. And Wilfred also runs the Black Farmer Scholarship Scheme, which helps people from inner cities to experience farming. Wilfred. Oh, hi. I've been hi. I've only got two minutes. I've got two. <laughs> and I'm going to be yeah. firm with you, Wilfred. Go on. Okay, two minutes. I've got to do this. But basically, yes, as, as you said in the intro, I created a brand called um, The Black Farmer some 15 years ago. And one of the reasons why I wanted to come on, on board to, to listen to what's been said today is that if you are black, and you are trying to start up a business, it's a bloody nightmare. And it's really <laughs> interesting to see banks here because banks are part of that bloody nightmare. And one of the things that I have seen as the great challenge is what you have is that you've got white people in the position of power making decisions about what they think would be a successful um, black business. There isn't the experience. I'll give you an example of that. Some of you might be aware that this year, I've done something for Black History Month. And the only way I managed to get that initiative off the ground is I had to do my sort of what I call my table thumping to all these big chief executives, all these white senior people to say, look, this is important. And it was a real fight and it's a real struggle. So my experience is that if you are black, in order to get the same opportunity, it's a bloody fight. So we could all be really nice and polite um, in this discussion, but I'm telling you, for the reality of a person of color, it's a real challenge. And part of that challenge is understanding the language, understanding the code, because those people who are in a position of power to decide who gets funding and who doesn't, they have a code, they have a language of their own. Big companies have people who specialize in understanding that language. And if you're a black person with none of that experience, you're at the bottom of the queue. So it'd be fascinating to know what sort of comes out of this sort of um, discussion. And it's really nice to know that it's on the agenda. But how do we go from talking about it to actually actioning things? And part of actioning it is that actually banks should be held to account. There needs to be someone saying, right, Mr. Bankman, how about is the percentage that you are loaning? to black companies what are you doing they need to have their feet held to the fire because until that happens we're still going to be going around and around and around in the circles where if you're black it's going to be a bloody struggle 
So I don't know if I've taken my two minutes up, but that's what I say. <laughs> no, actually, no, you're in full flow. Keep going for a little bit. <laughs> well, no, I, I've said the, essentially what I wanted to say really is that, you know, I just get very, very, very frustrated. And I know, and any black person in business, I know it's been a real struggle and it's a real challenge. And it comes down to the people in the position and power are white. And, you know, I don't want to come across as some sort of crazy lefty, but what's happening is that they're making decisions from their perspective. So you're not really going to get any fairness until you have people of color at senior levels. Just, just something as simple like getting my um, sausages off um, to celebrate Black History Month. I'm trying, I'm having to fight white perceptions and not really understanding the sort of the ethnic elements to, to to the discussion, and that's part of the frustration. So until we do something at that level where they're making the decisions, we could be talking about this until the cows come home. Pardon yeah. me. Yeah. No, <laughs> Wilfred. No, thank you very much indeed. You made your point very clearly and very powerfully. Um, I'm just going to move on now to uh, Melanie Eusebi, who's an award-winning entrepreneur and business strategist, who in 2014 launched the Black Business Awards, which I think are the largest awards program of their kind, aren't they? Yes, they are. And thank you so much, Alison, for having me. And actually, the Black Farmer was one of our inaugural winners our in our first year as an entrepreneur that we celebrate and we cherish to this day. So lovely. <laughs> <laughs> So we're coming from the perspective of almost 10 years of, of research in this space and what black business means and what black contribution is to the UK economy. And you know, the, the, the results are, are disheartening that usually black SMEs are ignored in, in so many ways. Um, if you try to look for stats in terms of how many black SMEs there are, um, in the UK or how many kind of entrepreneurs there are of black origin or black owned companies. And it's actually quite difficult. And that's in me working with several of our kind of key partners and pillars of the enterprise community. Most founder communities do not have proper representation of black talent and therefore there is no representation of, of black interests. So what needs to be done, quite frankly, is similar to what we have been doing with our, our corporate partners. And we have to open up kind of the, the conversation and we need to start speaking to black startups and black owned enterprises so that we can figure out what do they actually need. The conversation is similar to what happened when Alison Rose published the Rose Review a few years ago. We're really opening up the space and speaking about, well, what do women need in terms of their startup support and understanding some of the particular challenges and barriers. I'm so glad today is about Black because even though I do have, we, we have several BAME programs as part of the Black British Business Awards, but there is a very, and even though there are synergies in the solutions, we cannot lump together BAME and we cannot lump together. I When I speak to my Asian counterparts and the founders of the Asian Enterprise Awards, or Asian Achievement Awards, Asian Women of Business Awards, they're very different um, challenges that the Black community face in regards to access to capital, in regards to credibility in the marketplace. The thing is, is that most of us are starting our business in the five to nine while working in the nine to five. And that has an impact in regards to not just the startup, but also the scale up and the exit. So when we are speaking, the, when we work with organizations um, in regard, when they're looking at servicing and when they're looking at really getting to know their black SME base, number one, speak to us, talk to us, get to know our data. Who are we? You know, there's a huge amount of disposable income that is available in this space for not just kind of your financial services firms, but also in regards to your communications, media, technology, all of your cloud services. These are key services that startups need in regard to getting off the ground. But quite frankly, we're not speaking to black enterprises. Um, the role modeling as well, like how many people actually know that the black farmer exists and when they meet him, then he's just, he's just like a fireball. And he, of course he <laughs> motivates, he motivates beyond belief in terms of the art of the possible. And quite frankly, there are so many black entrepreneurs like this and we don't know about them and rarely are they featured and on, in the entrepreneurial landscape of the UK in the kind of on a wide scale. Um, 
Additionally, I think that the services and support that's needed, so I'm talking about access to capital. I know me as a woman, a black woman, I get 0.006% of venture capital and angel investment. <laughs> so I have the report and I can send it to you guys afterwards. And so if, you're, if, if that is 0.006%, that's barely a blip in the radar. And so how are we targeting our services, our support, or even whether it be paid for or whether it be government or third sector provided, how are we targeting them to the, the Black experience? Unfortunately, I guess in, you know, what we've seen in the past eight to 10 years of, of our work, and, and we, ha we have amassed a, an amazing group of entrepreneurs, award-winning, who are literally turning over millions of pounds a year, and yet their voices are not heard nor reflected in the entrepreneurial landscape of the UK, not in, in, in regards to their contribution, of course, as role models, but also in regards to their needs so that we can foster more. And so that's what I'd like to talk about today. And I'm, I'm really interested to hear what the, the rest of our panel in terms of solutions and tangible solutions that we can go forth with. Well, thanks yeah, for having thank yeah, Melanie, thank you very much for that. It's really interesting because um, several years ago, I started a not-for-profit, which was to support and encourage women to start their own business, because uh, I was aware of the uh, the small number of women who were taking that, that leap. Anyway, uh, our very first meeting in London, we had about 135 uh, women pitch up, and I was absolutely struck by the very high number of black and minority ethnic women who turned up and it it just it just hit me there, there and then that there was clearly a real need for support advice encouragement for this group of women in particular you know a, a subgroup of a group that i thought i was addressing because it, and it was just, you know, their, their representation of that meeting. There was there was so many, uh, okay. and I just thought, gosh, you know, this is a this is a cry uh, a cry for help. And it, it, I never forget that it made a huge impression on me. Yeah, yeah, we can't we can't do anything when we have an, an entrepreneur when we have our enterprise academy events. We're we're at capacity. We've had to upgrade our Zoom license. It's it's. <laughs> <laughs> A badge of honor having to upgrade your Zoom license. <laughs> Melanie, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to move on now to Samuel uh, Okafor, who is the co lead of the Black, Asian, and Minority Ethnic Task Force and global co chair of the NatWest Multicultural Network. And I understand you've got over 20 years' experience in NatWest retail banking. So, Samuel, over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, morning, Alison and, and everyone. Morning. And thank you for having us. Um, yes, so we, uh, I co-lead the, the um, Black Asian Minority Ethnic Task Force set up in uh, June by Alison Rose, the group CEO. And um, it's really set up to really listen and to learn and to understand what more we can do to support our Black Asian Minority Ethnic customers, colleagues and communities and to really understand what we as an organisation um, can do in terms of the actions that we can take to support them and to understand the barriers and the challenges that still exist. As a result of our work um, that we've done, we last week published a, a report which um, is available um, to everyone uh, called Banking on Racial Equality. Um, and we've um, published a set of commitments that we as an organisation uh, want to take forward to support our Black, Asian, minority, ethnic customers, colleagues and communities, as well as um, a new uh, target as well. Um, you'll see from the work that we've done, just linking into Melanie's point that she's put on there, um, we try to really break out the term BAME because we recognise that there are different challenges that are faced by Black, Asian, minority, ethnic, and the different ethnic groups as well. So um, uh, really looking forward to the conversation today and thank you for having us. Thank you very much, that's short and sweet. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, uh, and uh, and finally, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Monda Ram Obi, who is the director of um, the Centre for Research in Ethnic Minority Entrepreneurship and a leading authority on small business and ethnic mi minority entrepreneurship. I wonder how many times I'm going to say entrepreneurship today. Um, Professor Ram, over to you. Thank you very much, Alison. Uh, it's been fascinating listening to the other contributors. Um, I think I would like to say a few things. First is to acknowledge the kind of climate that we're in. I think the constellation of Black Lives Matter, COVID and uh, Brexit has sort of shone a light on in inequality and shown real profound and deep-seated fractures in our society. 
And um, those are going to get played out in the domain of entrepreneurship. And what I really want to do is highlight, for me, two or three major challenges and potential lines of inquiry when we're thinking about solutions. The first is to recognize that in this space, we, um, when we're talking about black and ethnic minority communities, we are really uh, in entrepreneurship and employment. We are we must acknowledge the systemic nature of the disadvantage they face in all policy domains. Uh, the, the recent report by the British Bank, uh, the BBB British Business Bank, has highlighted that in a very sharp and acute way. Black entrepreneurs, I think minority entrepreneurs, place, uh, face disadvantage in uh, finance kind of markets that they try to uh, get the kind of the places where they're located. And also there's a sort of fractures in relation to gender as well. So there's a, a number of disadvantages they face. And the other influences I've mentioned, uh, COVID-19 has really th shown that, brought that into, brought that to the fore even more. So I think it's really important that when we're thinking about entrepreneurship, everyone's talking about potential solutions. And I welcome that. But I don't think this is the time anymore for cosmetic solutions or superficial solutions that look at fixing black entrepreneurs. We need to fix the system. So that's my first point. The second point is whilst recognizing the importance and the deep-seated challenges that minority communities face, it is also important to start thinking about the narrative that we perpetuate and the need to actually change it. By that, I mean, um, we've just done my centre, the Centre for Research in Ethnic Minority Entrepreneurship, just done the biggest ever study of ethnic minority entrepreneurship in the UK for the Federation of Small Businesses called Unlocking Opportunity. There's a number of really major findings. It's based on over 10 years of data. But three things I think stand out. Ethnic minority entrepreneurs are more innovative than their white counterparts. They're more likely to grow their businesses than their uh, white counterparts and they're more, more likely to export. Now, those are three core qualities uh, that we, I suppose, are looking for when we're thinking about the kinds of businesses that will see us through the COVID-19 recovery. But I don't see those qualities feature in the discourse on ethnic minority entrepreneurship. And that needs to change. Yes, we need to acknowledge the profound challenges facing black and ethnic minority entrepreneurs, but also we also realize that they are making their way towards the top end and providing real, exam, uh, real leadership in these areas. As Melanie uh, said, though, it's just not sufficiently acknowledged. And the third and final point I would make, uh, Alison, is the nature of solutions, which I've alluded to in my opening comments. Um, I'm predicting a, sort of a frenzy of activity to respond to this agenda now. Uh, and that's welcome. Uh, it's long overdue. What I don't, what I sort of caution against, though, is in our urgency to do something, what we end up doing is have a, a sort of crowded platform of initiatives that simply do not address the profound nature of the problems we face for me it's not just a question of particular training although that's important or p d discrete sc schemes we need to look at how the system perpetuates inequality and that's why i think when we look at entrepreneurship we we need to look at um, economic inequality we need to look at wider employment issues because too often Ethnic minorities are disproportionately represented in entrepreneurship because they're blocked out the corporate sector, they're blocked out the public sector, and there's this perpetual um, income inequality, the ethnic pay gap, so-called ethnic pay gap. And we need to look at solutions in the round so we address the structural issues that perpetuate the inequalities that we're drawing attention to today. Thank you very much, Alison. Uh, thank you very much indeed. That kind of leads very neatly into my first question and you you've answered it somewhat but perhaps could go into a bit more detail you know generically speaking what more 
can and should the government do to support further diversity in entrepreneurship? I mean, you know, does it start with a review like the Rose Review, which obviously looked at female entrepreneurship? Where does it where does it begin? Well, is that for me, Alison? Yes, sorry, that's for you. And then I'm going to go to, to Wilfred. Sorry, yes. Thank you, well, I think the government has uh, a major role to play. I mean, it has a, a legislative uh, function, which I think could be utilised to strengthen e equality legislation. We have to realise that government also are massive proc procurers and they could send a, send a strong signal about where their um, money is being spent and how they utilize it most government mini ministers have an interface with small businesses and um, whether there could be a role there a learning from the state every government department have a, has an office of small business utilization we could think uh, about that and there's the really strong signaling powers that you know we it can convene organizations and say look these are prof you could really ask the question in a serious way of the corporate sector, of the public sector, what are you doing to tackle systemic dis disadvantage in your policy domain? So I think government has a strong role to play, but the corporate sector has too. Um, and I, we can come on to that a bit later, if you like, Alison, because I know others will want to get in as well. Yes. Um, Wilfred, so you're an entrepreneur on the ground. What would you like to see the government doing? Okay, before I answer that, Alison, one of the things yeah. I just wanted to say, really, and um, it's not really having a go at you, but this for me is what I think is part of the problem. Here we are having a discussion about supporting ethnic diversity in ent ent entrepreneurship, and it's been yeah. chaired by a white woman. Now, <laughs> is, well, why is that? I mean, who organized that? Could they find a black person to chair it? You see, so. As I said, I don't want to embarrass you, but these are the sort of questions that we have to ask ourselves. Why are we having somebody white doing it? And then in terms of what government could do is actually it's about how do you prioritize this as being important? And that is putting it very high on the list of the priorities. Now, it's fascinating that NatWest is saying that they are supporting this and they're behind this. But, you know, there's a lot of talk about reviews but what I want to hear is, well, what is the action? And the action is what this is what we have put into place. And one of the things that frustrates me when we discuss this diversity agenda, it tends to be hijacked by the things that white people feel comfortable with, which tends to be things involve women. So the moment you start talking about diversity, they'll then go and tell you about all the stuff they do regarding gender. But when it comes back to the big, big issue about black people black people getting an opportunity that's when everybody gets a bit uncomfortable that's when it gets a bit sort of flustered and one of the things that i was quite quite fascinating is that when i go to corporate buildings i never see any white people at all you just don't when you go to senior level and during black history month i think i've seen more black people they just chuck them think bloody hell we better start <laughs> showing that you know we've got a few of them hanging around and they chuck them up to um demonstrate um that they're doing something so for me, the most important thing to do is let's not hide behind reviews, let's not hide behind a discussion, it's the action, it's the action that we all personally do. And it comes back to that fundamental question, if this is a big, big event, why is it being chaired by a white person? That's what I'd like to say. Okay, no, <laughs> well, no offence taken, and, and, you know, maybe that's in the interests of balance, but there you go. Um, Thank you very oh, much. Well, well, well done. So you have to have a white person in the interest of balance. That's craziness. <laughs> implying that a black person can't be balanced. No. No, 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 no. Just in terms of the, the balance of who we've got to talking today. But but point taken. Uh, OK, so talking about what can be done. Um, and Melanie, this one's for you. You know, what about the role of education in uh, giving young people experience in entrepreneurship? So sort of going back to the beginning of the process and making entrepreneurship uh, a more natural, normalizing it as a choice um, for people. I mean, you, you know, with your experience of awards and showcasing talent, I always say you can't be it if you can't see it. So it's really important to have to have practical experience and exposure to entrepreneurship from an early age. What's your feeling about that? 
most definitely. It is certainly a case of you can't be what you can't see. However, I think that there is a gross underestimation in regards to the role of enterprise in the, the Black community. And so even though it may not be um, publicized, but if we start all the way with um, partners or SUSUs and, bank, and creating banking, creating kind of alternative banking means for our finances, we have a long history of being entrepreneurial and it's not necessarily by choice, but actually by need. Because as it was mentioned just a few moments ago, uh, typically we don't find the either the, the career kind of success or the financial success in corporate, um, in corporate places. And so you'll find that there is a mass exodus of black people who right around the age of 28 to 35, who leave corporate structures to, to become entrepreneurs. And those examples were set by our forefathers and by our parents. Entre enterprise, quite frankly, is a long, strong thread in the black community everywhere. So that's from Brazil to Australia, to Canada, to the US, and certainly of course here in the UK. However, that is out of more so need um, because of the other avenues being closed off or being kind of uh, being narrowed. Yeah. However, if we look down, if we look to our media sources, uh, if we look up to our, our panels, of course, our events, then we are not seeing the, the Black British talent that is out there. And so for the, this example, for uh, this year at the Black British Business Awards, we have um, one of the finalists is a developer of horse feed. And she has developed, in the midst of developing UK patent, she has a European patent. And you know, you would never think of a black woman developing a horse feed business and actually turning, having a multi-million pound business. And no one knows about her, but she's been around for a while now. And and so there is a gap in the market, certainly. I don't think the gap is in the um the the number of enterprises or the exposure to enterprise as a career, but it's also about the um the 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 showcasing the successful entrepreneurs as well and so i i don't it, it's a it's a catch 22 really there has to be more work done to display and expose and speak to entrepreneurs so that we can kind of create that cycle of development education i, I, I have to say the only reason why i stray away from the word education is because there's something about it that reminds me of fixing the talent rather than fixing the culture and fixing the society with which we live in and so even though yes of course enterprise takes education this is you know it's a it's a learning journey in itself starting a business however it's a learning journey that you know ever, like quite frankly, white men have to go through as well. Like it's all, it's, it's, we all have to go through the learning journeys. And so let's not position black people as needing above and beyond help that anyone else would need in terms of starting up a business. Uh, because then it just makes us, it, it's almost like we're, we're second class citizens. And that's what we're trying to move away from that actually the need is there, the capability is there. And quite frankly, let's put the structures and the resources around people so that they can succeed. Actually, I was just looking at some comments uh, that were coming in and one uh, one person watching said that they were looking uh, for investors and told to get uh, a white partner. Um, does that shock you? Melanie. No, it doesn't shock me at all. My two, the Black British Business Awards are co-founded by two white women and they have helped me. Um, they helped me because I didn't know how to run an awards program, but much less start one. And <laughs> it, but it's a different kind of help. Um, it, it's a help that says that we are using our, we're sharing our platform for you to create your own platform. It's not uh, sharing our platform so that I can get the accolade. And it's very, and, and so I think that white allyism, allyism as a whole, you know that I'm a huge proponent of it. Um, but so how do we, um, so yes, you do want to get learnings and you do want to share learnings, but in regards to, um, this is not kind of the 1960s, you know, the, I don't know if anyone's seen the movie, The Banker, where, you know, they have to dress up a janitor so because, and he can pretend to be the, the head of the bank and it's two black men who are winning it. That's a real historical story. I don't think it's quite the same. However, we do need to 
have take create opportunities for kind of learning transfer and educational transfer in regards to people who have done it before, who are successful at it. Melanie, thank you. I just wanted to bring Andrew in here to go back on some of the points that Wilfred was making. I know you wanted to have a, a say a few things. Yeah, but I, I think I think we shouldn't move past the young culture. I think Wilfred's right to to really. Um, you know, grab us by the neck and shake us around a bit because unless we have the difficult conversations and do something about this, things are never going to change. Um, and I guess as a, a white person in that senior position in the bank, I'm, I'm certainly part of the problem, but hopefully part of the solution. And I think, Wilfred, what we need to have is some really you know, difficult um, and challenging conversations, but constructive ones, which allow us to move forward. Um, you know, there is some some research that um, Samuel has led for, for the bank where, with, with colleagues, which bring out some really stark figures in terms of the theme of discouragement. You know, so, um, you know, when you look at, uh, you know, entrepreneurs who are seeking or thinking about raising finance, but are discouraged because they think they won't get a fair um, hearing from the, from the funder, um, you know, 44% of black African people they don't apply for, for bank finance because they just don't think they'll get a fair hearing. And that compares to 4% of white people. I mean, that's shocking. Um, and, you know, that points to me that there's something structurally not right um, in terms of how we engage, support, speak, and in, indeed decide upon the, the, you know, the customers that we support. Um, and I think these are absolutely the issues that we need to bring out. I think research is important because... I think we need to, to understand that uh, and understand some of these issues. But I think you know, we also need to change from within. Uh, and I think, Wilfred, you, you mentioned about targets. Um, so, you know, to Alison, you know, they've been very clear in terms of setting some um, targets around um, senior uh, positions within the bank being, being black people. Um, and, and from a BAME background, uh, and also, you know, 20% of all of our entrepreneurship programs will be from black entrepreneurs. So we are starting to set those targets. You could argue that they are still low and they need to be bigger and more ambitious. But I think we are starting down this road and hope to work with you and others, you know, to make the full transformation. Samuel, would you want to step in here and say a few words? Yeah, just to uh, build on what um, Andrew said, I think it's fair to say that, you know, um, when the Black Lives Matter movement took place earlier on in this year, you know, we were really keen not to, you know, rush out of a set of commitments. We we faced into what Andrew said in terms of those uncomfortable conversations. And we've been really challenging each other and the organisation to face into those into these conversations. And, and what you'll see as a result of the conversations that have taken place is a, is a detailed report of our findings and actually we've been really transparent in terms of some of our internal data so when we look at you know to Wilfred's point opportunities to advance their careers when we asked all of our colleagues you know 79% of our white colleagues said they could advance in their careers in, in the organization 50% of Asian colleagues said they could 28% of black colleagues said they said they could as well so you can really see the work that we've done in really facing into those conversations and the banking on racial equality report details that in in full and what we've what we produced is a set of commitments that that we need to hold ourselves account and we'll hold ourselves account around what we're going to do not just things that we're going to review but actual things that we're going to do and take forward and we've set ourselves for the first time a black target of um colleagues in the uk senior roles and um We've got to work hard to deliver on those commitments and also those targets. So I'm really pleased that we're not shying away from the conversation. I'm really pleased that we we've pressed into the conversation. They are uncomfortable, but as people have had those conversations, they've become more comfortable with it. And I'm really encouraged by the commitment and the report and our transparency as an organisation. Thank you very much, Samuel. Or Wilfred, do you want to say, um, because obviously you, you've got this on the ground experience of running and scaling your business, do you want to talk more specifically about some of the challenges that you've faced in uh, scaling your business and how you've overcome them? Well, I think, you know, I don't want to keep going on about this, but I think the problem does come down to the people who are in the position of power. And the people in the position of power are the ones who are determining what happens to us as black people. And if there isn't enough diversity on that level, 
we could be talking until the cows come home and it's not going to make a difference. Now, the thing that I did for the Black History Month, which is I got every single supermarket in the country to get behind this initiative. And I had to convince white people to, to get behind this. It didn't make any difference, but I had to convince them. And what I'm sick to death of is that I've got to be aggressive. I've got to fight. I've got to be shaking people in order to get things done. What I would like is for the people in the position of power is not to see that black is on the fringe, that black is part of the mainstream. In my industry especially, they think, oh, right, we've got to do this stuff to accommodate these black people. It's about understanding that we are part of the mainstream. And so for you, Andrew, just little tiny things that you could do. So I know that as a bank, you are really behind being entrepreneurial and you do some interesting things. But like this event, something as simple as saying, actually, we should go out and search for a black person to chair it. That's the sort of thing you should be doing. I know you do a fantastic podcast with Holly Tucker about entrepreneurship. She's fantastic. But again, part of the simple decisions you can make, actually, let's go out and find a black person who could equally do that sort of stuff. So, that, so the thing that irritates me to death is people talk about their bloody reports and there are little tiny things in terms that you could do that will send a signal. No wonder black people don't think that actually banks are there to support them because the little tiny easy things that they could do, they, it doesn't come into their orbit of thinking about the signal it sends. The signal it sends that actually you're doing an event like this and it's chaired by a white person. Do you know what I mean? It sends a signal. You know, the question that somebody was saying, well, you need to have a white person, they're going to have an investor. Well, you just demonstrated that. You just demonstrated by having an event that has to be chaired by, by a white person. Sorry, that's it happened. Sorry, say that again. I was just saying that you know what, I'm not gonna let you stand alone on that one. More and more organizations are saying, wait a minute, are we even in what we do, in how we present, in our product warehousing, all the way up to our customer servicing? Are we representing black SMEs? Right now, financial services is a little bit behind, but if you're looking at some of the other kind of communications, media, technology, all of the, the, the firms that are particularly relevant to startups, so I'm talking about your cloud services, I'm talking about your phones, the things that we, we need that we set up as soon as we start a business, they're all on it. They're all like, wait a minute, Black SMEs are a, a critical target market for us. Diageo, exactly like alcohol, it goes all the way through to products, services, communications, media technology. They are targeting black SMEs, and that means that they are learning about it, learning about our needs, and they are saying, wait, our customer servicing, we don't reflect black people. Our product, when we develop our products, we don't reflect black people. Like it's 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 actually quite ludicrous that we are in this place right now where people are trying to reach out to the black population and service and sell to them, but actually they have no representation of black people in their organizations. And that's quite frankly, the narrative, that's where the narrative is going, where black people are getting a lot more savvy about where they put their money and who they bank with, who they use in terms of services. And they're saying, do you represent me? Do you even know what I need? Do you, are you speaking to me? And it, it's, it's, that's my day job for Accenture. That's what we're talking about. That's who, that's who I'm selling my work to people who are looking at us as a viable consumer base as well. So I'm not going to let Wilford stand alone on this one. There is, so, there's a lot of work that we can do <laughs> to represent black interests in a deeper, more meaningful way so that we're actually representing their interests at the boardroom table as well. Um, I want to come back to Andrew in a minute, but just because we're, we're talking about um, diversity, supply chains, what have you, um, Professor Ram, what are your um, findings in this area with regard to, you know, what can be done to ensure diversity in the, in the supply chain? Well, there's a whole host of uh, initiatives that uh, are working on this space. We're running one from Aston ourselves. Uh, so th th there are initiatives um, around but I think in terms of what can be done, I think, as I said, government and the corporate sector have a really important role here. Um, you could learn from the practice from the states. Uh, it's something that we could do on um, big infrastructure projects like H HS2. These are huge opportunities. And if there's, there's, if leveling up it means anything, it's really using the heft of government to say, look, inclusive growth is meaningless unless 
um, it includes everyone, including the kinds of constituencies that uh, colleagues are, are on the on this um, call um, represent. And I think in terms of the, the banks, the banks specifically, and this is not a point solely for NatWest Bank, but I hopefully it, it, they'll be interested in a response. Be one of the recurring findings in the work is that uh, black business owners, ethnic minority business owners are actually discouraged from rate, wanting to raise finance. This is not a perception. It's an empirical fact. Right. And, you know, we I'm, I'm not sure what initiatives are in place to address that. This is not a matter of speculation. It's concrete evidence that has been a recurring theme in the work. And very few people are talking about that. So you can have all the initiatives that you want, but, but if people, black and ethnic minority communities, self-exclude because they think they're going to be treated adversely, all the goodwill in the world won't do anything. We need to address that core issue. And I think that needs immediate action. Andrew, do you want to come in here? Um, so, so I, mean, I guess first you picking up that point, Monda. I agree, and I, I think I just mentioned earlier that you know of our own research, forty four percent of black people, um, you know, don't uh, apply for finance because they think they'll be they'll be um, excluded when they when they apply compared to four percent of white. So, you know, that, that absolutely says to me that there's something systemically wrong in terms of how um, you know we engage and then. Um, I guess decide decide upon credit decisions. So, you know that is something which um, you know is at the forefront of our minds and is something where we need to and you know, work with yourselves and others you know, to, to to really unpick this in terms of you know, um, you know how much of that is um, systemically in terms of how we make decisions, how much is it in terms of how we communicate to communities. Um, how much is it about financial education? I mean, I think there's some really interesting um, you know, points which were made earlier as well in terms of, you know, um, you know the, the way that we, um, the language that we use is technical, um, um, technical English. You know, there's plenty of research which would say as well um, that that can be impenetrable for, for people, um, you know, particularly from ethnic communities in terms of trying to understand what the products and services are and how to access them. So I, I think this is a is a really you know, huge issue that we need to lean into and we're very committed to doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I think to, to, to Wilfred's point, I mean, you know, I feel your anger and frustration coming coming across the, uh, the, the, the airwaves to me. And I think you like to, I mean, if, if I was in your position, I'd be um, really angry and upset as well. I, mean, I would point to, we have been doing similar um, webinars, um, Power and Communities webinars as well. So we do some with Holly Tucker, but we've also been doing a number with, with black entrepreneurs as well for this very reason uh, that we want to champion all business and you know, make sure that there's role models for all parts of the UK community. Um, but, you know, absolutely, you know, is there more that we could and should be doing? Yes, absolutely. We need to you know, shift our collective buttocks and get on with it rather, rather than talking about it. And, you know, I think working with you and others to help us find and navigate the right way through this, I think is, is important because we don't have the answers ourselves. You know, we need, we need your help. We need to transform ourselves. You know, bring more diversity into senior levels within our organisation, which we're working on. Uh, and, you know, as I say, we are, you know, very focused on, making sure that all communities across the UK have the opportunity to reach their potential. Um, can I just ask Andrew a question here? Please quickly? go for it. So, for example, um, with um, this big initiative, within the bank itself, do you have any black people on, let's say, as non-execs who are there to actually give you um, some thoughts on the outside? I mean, that's what I'm interested in, you know, okay? The only way you're going to get truth is to have people like that who are living and experiencing on your boards in, um, so we, in the discussion. So if you look at our non-executive uh, team, the bank's non-executives, um, there, there is a diverse group in terms of, um, uh, I'm not certain that we've got anybody black, but we've certainly got uh, BAME representation uh, at, a, at a very senior level in the bank on, on our non-exec board. So, so, so the, an, the answer is yes, but we haven't got... I guess, again, this is where you start to talk about Bain, where if you want to talk about Black specifically, I think we, we probably are underrepresented. 
well, you have a chance to do something about it. That's the point they're making. So when that's why it's not good to group. Don't call us diverse or BAME, because what people do is they go for the easy wins. And the easy wins traditionally have been to do with gender, to do with the Asian community, and blacks are really low on the bottom of the pile. That's the reality of the situation. And so that's why I think we need to be seen as a separate group rather than bunched all together. And we've lost out because we've been bunched all together. And so, you know, I don't want to sort of stop anybody getting any um, advantage from actually people realizing there's been inequalities, but the reality is there's a race that goes on in this diversity agenda and women have done really well out of it. The second of the Asian and blacks are still very, very much low down on the list of priorities. That needs to be fixed. Um, Samuel, is there some, yes, sorry, I was going to say, is there something you'd like and to Wilfred, say there? Just, yeah, just, just to add on to that. So I think it's a great point you made and to build on what Andrew said. So from the work that the task force has done, we recognize that. So you'll see that we've broken down BAME from the work that we've done. We've not lumped it all into one because it, it hides the challenges that different ethnic um, minorities face. And hence the reason we recognize our significant underrepresentation at black colleagues in senior levels. Hence the reason we published um, last week a black specific goal because when we saw the breakdown of where we were, whilst we're tracking well on overall BAME, when we saw the actual percentage or numbers of people in black um, in, in, in roles, black colleagues, we recognise that obviously we've got some work to do, hence the reason we published a black specific goal last week. Wilfred, any comeback on that? Well, it's good. It's good. You know, <laughs> it's all good. You know, nice words. Let's do the action. So, you know, it's going in the right direction. OK, um, one, I just want to, I'm conscious that we've had a few questions coming in from people watching. We've got a couple of minutes, so I'm going to quickly get this question in. Um, so the comment was from the Cambridge Social Ventures, who said it's so true that BAME people come to entrepreneurship to create their own opportunities. In social entrepreneurship, we also see BAME people working to address problems which affect their communities. So I guess the question is, you know, is it the experience of the panel that ethnic minorities are particularly good at solving challenges in their communities? That's open to the floor. Uh I think we should be really, really careful that because the problems that they're trying, they're, they're, they're striving to solve for are down to institutional racism and systemic racism. And quite frankly, that usually means that they are servicing a smaller customer base, right? They're only ser servicing a smaller part of the people population. The, the problem with that is that, just remember that enterprise along with um, property is the primary means of wealth generation and wealth kind of, and, and wealth generation in terms of passing it between generations. And so if we are saying that, if, we are, if, there are if there is institutional racism and certain populations are more affected by that, that means that certain populations are going to direct their enterprises towards that. So that usually means is that their businesses are smaller on a whole in regards to turnover in regards to their customer base. So um, yes, I think that you, it's right that uh, black people, particularly if we're talking about today, do think of social enterprises or they think of child or they, they, they create businesses that solve for their community's particular challenges, whether it be access to hair care, whether it be access to finance, but the problem with that is that they're actually their customer base usually means that is 10 to 12 percent of the population. Right. And so that yeah. automatically means that yeah. businesses are going to be smaller as a whole in regards to scale up. And then we see the same problem that we do have some startups. We do have people starting businesses at companies houses. But then it, like we work with Nesta and then we're seeing that less black businesses actually go for this, the massive scale up. And. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it is a catch twenty two. It, it it's is. great. Can we can solve our problems. And Wilfred, yes. Yes, I was going to say, Melanie. I absolutely agree with you. And so again, what that's doing, that attitude is ghettoizing black people because there's not what you need in business is volume, and volume is being part of the mainstream. So the idea that you're going to be able to create a good substantial business with just your 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 small community, those sort of business would fail all too often. They're set up to fail because they're never going to be able to sort of expand. And what and I think what the mainstream are doing, they're ghettoizing those people to say, okay, we'll let them over there, but it's not allowing them into the mainstream. And the only way we're going to actually 
make people think there's an opportunity is that if you see them as part of the mainstream. So, Melanie, I agree with you 100%. One of the other things I'd like to say is that the reason why a lot of black people start their own businesses is because, could you imagine something like me being employed in corporate life? You know, <laughs> you know I wouldn't get past the go. So what happens? <laughs> a lot of people from, um, from the black community, because of their, you know, the way they do things, they're forced to go and do their own things because corporate Britain wouldn't touch them with a barge pole. So, you know, it, it, that's one of the reasons why we end up having to do our own thing also. I knew one thing at the beginning of this hour that an hour wasn't going to be enough and it's it's not um, and we've come to the end of it unfortunately uh, so hopefully there will be an opportunity for a continuation of this discussion but um, I just uh, wanted to say a massive thank you to the Entrepreneurs Network uh, and to NatWest thank you very much indeed um, for hosting this um, and thank you to all of those of you who have joined us. And I don't know if Philip Salter would like to just say a couple of words very quickly about the Entrepreneurs Network in case anybody listening would like to um, become a member. Philip, if you're there. Um, if I, you're, oh, um, he is there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, I guess um, this is one of many um, events we're doing. And um, I think there are kind of discussions with NatWest about doing more stuff like this. So do sign up to our newsletter. We'll keep you updated. On these events and also any other um, events in this space that you're interested in doing. So thank you to Alison and thanks also to a wonderful panel and I wish as, as Alison says this could have gone on uh, a lot longer than this because I think there's a lot of issues that really need a lot more time and attention. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you to the panel, fantastic panel.